everyone. Um, thank you, Bernie, for having me here today. I'm really excited to uh, get to meet with academic librarians and researchers who are uh, discussing questions with regard to the integrity of data and use of collections in new and innovative ways. And I'm excited to tell you about the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you about the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, or the AAPB, as I will refer to it uh, in my presentation. Um, and I'll provide you a background and overview of the AAPB, uh, share some thoughts with you on what we see as the value of this collection uh, for historical uh, research. And I'll talk about some of the policies and methods we've developed to provide researchers with access to our collection in new ways. And I'll do my best to talk a little bit and convey to you some of the research being done by researchers at Brandeis University, um, at Dartmouth College, and the University of Colorado Boulder. So in case you're not familiar with the AAPB, we're a collaboration between the Library of Congress and WGBH in Boston, which is a public broadcasting station. Uh, the initiative was established by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in 2013, but you can actually date our initiative back to the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, uh, which created the CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and mandated that CPB establish and maintain a library and archives of public media. And the AAPB is the culmination of this mandate. Our mission is to coordinate a national effort to preserve at-risk public broadcasting content before it is lost to posterity and pr provide a centralized web portal for access to the unique programming aired by public stations over the past 70 plus years. So the Library of Congress's Packard Campus for Audiovisual Conservation in Culpeper, Virginia serves as the preservation arm of our initiative. I don't think they need much of an introduction. Um, but WGBH, in case you're unfamiliar with who we are, we're a producer of public broadcasting content and home to the WGBH Media Library and Archives. Uh, we produce about one third of what you see on nas nationally distributed on PBS, shows like Antiques Roadshow, Masterpiece Theater, Nova, Frontline, American Experience, Arthur are all shows that we produce. So as I mentioned, the Library of Congress is responsible for the long-term preservation of the digital files that we're digitizing and acquiring from stations all across the country. WGBH is responsible for metadata management, um, for maintaining our archival management system, and for the, our public website and access and outreach to the uh, participating organizations and stations. We share governance responsibilities and collaboratively make decisions on policy, collection development, workflows, and uh, rights decisions. Our goals are lofty. Uh, we seek to coordinate a national effort to, uh, to preserve as much public broadcasting content as possible. We seek to become a focal point of discoverability of this historic material. And we also provide standards such as our stewardship of the PB Core metadata schema uh, and provide best practices to public broadcasting stations around storing and preserving their collections, understanding that we're not going to be able to preserve everything. We also seek to facilitate the use of the archive by scholars, by students, educators, and the general public. And we're also passionate just about increasing the awareness and, and significance of historic public media um, and its need for preservation. So while the project was in development by CPB in 2011-2012, CPB began with an inventory project where 120 stations across the country were funded to create inventories of all the tapes they had held in their possession over the years. This resulted in 2.5 million inventory records, and actually a total of 3 million items were identified. Uh, there were several universities and other organizations that contributed to the effort. Um, but this is just really a drop in the bucket. Those 120 stations are about 9% of the public media stations out there. Um, so CPB then subsequently funded a large-scale digitization project where 100 stations, still only a drop in the bucket, were funded to digitize a percentage of their collections. And this resulted in 40,000 hours of local programming that was digitized from analog tapes um, into a digital format. And at this point, CPB uh, selected the Library of Congress and WGBH to be the permanent stewards of this collection and to move the initiative forward. So um, our website and our online reading room launched in 2015. And the more than 50,000 hours at this point, or about 101,000 items that we've digitized or born digital material that we've collected is accessible for researchers who physically come to the Library of Congress and WGBH. And nearly 50% of the collection is available in our online reading room, access, accessible, open to the public for anyone in the United States for research, educational, and informational purposes. 
And the website also provides searchable access to the 2.5 million inventory records that we uh, collected during the inventory project for materials that are not yet digitized. And we have participation nationally from content creators and contributors um, that, of materials to the archive, which currently includes public broadcasting stations and archives in 41 states plus DC and Guam. Uh, with nearly 120 participating organizations and content produced by over 430 independent producers and organizations across the country. And we're seeking to grow the archive by up to 25,000 hours per year. We actually just finished digitizing every uh, broadcast episode of the PBS NewsHour and its pre predecessor series dating back to 1975. Um, and it's not easy to overstate the imperative need for preserving um, this and other audiovisual materials, which are increasingly at risk of loss to posterity. In 2012, the Library of Congress's National Recording Preservation Plan stated that many endangered analog formats must be digitized within the next 15 to 20 years before degradation makes preservation efforts all but impossible. And moreover, audiovisual materials are the fastest growing segment of our nation's archives um, and special collections. And in 1997, 22 years ago, the Library of Congress recognized the historic and cultural significance of public broadcasting as a source for historical research. Um, in the 1997 Television and Video Preservation Report, they stated that public television has been responsible for the production, broadcast, and dissemination of some of the most important programs, which in aggregate form the richest audiovisual source of cultural history in the United States. It is still not easy to overstate the immense cultural value of this unique audiovisual legacy, whose loss would symbolize one of the great conflagrations of our age, tantamount to the burning of Alexandria's library in the age of antiquity. And scholars who have supported our work have repeatedly complained about the lack of access to audiovisual materials. A historian of the civil rights movement has written to us, I have long been frustrated by the difficulty of gaining access to the vast audiovisual record of my period. A media historian similarly wrote to us that public broadcasting programs remain locked in the collections of its many member stations and bringing them out of obscurity would be an immense boon to scholars, not only of media history, but of the era as well. And more recently, we've started getting inquiries from scholars seeking not only access to the media individually, but to the collection as a data set uh, in use in emerging forms of digital scholarship. So we had one, one scholar wrote to us, I would love to incorporate the archive as a data source in a central thematic topic as part of a visual interactive database project. So these are some inquiries that we're starting to receive and we're thinking about how we can improve access to our collection in ways that would support this type of research. So we hope to, uh, to provide a centralized web portal for discovery where researchers, educators, and students, and really anyone can find public broadcasting programs existing either on our own site or on sites belonging to other archives and stations. With the approximately 1,250 public radio and television stations in existence, one access point aids scholars interested in researching how national or even international topics have been covered in divergent localities over the past 60 plus years. We've made a start at becoming that portal um, if stations and archives have metadata uh, to materials that they've made available on their own archive websites, uh, we can take that metadata and provide direct links out to their sites. But for the most part, we host the content because most of the stations just don't have the resources. Um, this is how the Digital, Library of, uh, uh, um, Digital Public Library of America operates, and we are now at this point searchable through the DPLA as well. We really just want to help solve this separate silo syndrome whereby researchers have to go all over the place trying to find what they're looking for. Our website is accessible at AmericanArchive.org. Uh, the site is a searchable digital library with uh, keyword search and advanced searches that can be browsed um, for search results. Users can limit their search results by different metadata fields and then view and listen to the digitized media and access metadata about those items. We've also created um, searchable transcripts of every item in the collection. Initially, we were working with Pop-Up Archive, which uh, was acquired by Apple, so th their software is now proprietary, um, but we're now using an open source tool that they released prior to their acquisition by Apple. We also curate special collections to highlight materials of particular significance. Um, these feature materials from a specific series or collection. One example is the NewsHour collection, as I recently, recently mentioned, but also this wonderful 1970s talk show um, produced out of WNED in Buffalo called Woman, which 
um, brought all of these amazing feminist uh, activists from across the country to talk about women's issues of the time. We also have posted raw, unedited interviews from Eyes on the Prize. You know, one or two minutes made it into the final cut, where the hour-long conversations with these uh, individuals are now available, as well as many other collections. And we also curate uh, topic-based curated exhibits to organize local and national broadcasts into uh, around topics of historical significance, such as climate change, civil rights. Um, we also recently posted entire public broadcasting's coverage of the uh, Watergate hearings uh, hosted by Jim Lehrer and Robert McNeil, which was their first collaborative effort together. But because of the geographical breadth of the material, researchers can use the collection to help uncover ways that national and even global processes played out on the local scene. The long chronological reach of the collection from the late 1940s to the present supplies researchers with previously inaccessible primary source material that will be allow them to document change or stasis over time. And the AAPB includes an extraordinarily diverse collection of programming covering many localities across the US um, and much that occurred throughout the nation during the past 60 plus years. Uh, the materials offer unique television and radio programming that document many of the subjects you see here, plus more. And the collection further includes many different types of programming, from debates and news reports to local documentaries, cultural magazines, unedited interviews to with eyewitnesses to historic events, many of which, um, with regard to the uh, interviews, have never been seen before by public audiences. The, uh, the collection contains a wealth of material produced locally for local audiences, and these programs represent an untapped important, local, uh, important resource. During the 1960s and 1970s, many historians began to focus on social history or history from the bottom up instead of on national elites. This emphasis on diversity, Alan Brinkley has written, presumed that the history of the nation is many different stories, no one of which can be considered the main story. More recently, some historians have also advocated for integrating the national story into wider context. The goal is to relate national experiences to larger processes and also to local resolutions, Thomas Bender has written. The material in the collection is especially important because of the era it reflects. There remains much basic excavation and interpretive work in recent American history for the present generation of scholars to accomplish. A recent essay noted that American history scholarship pertaining from the period of 1973 onwards is limited, fragmentary, and politically conflicted. Accounts about later periods, the author concluded, have not really been history. So how do scholars want to access and use a public media archive? Trevor Munoz, the director of the Maryland Institute uh, for Technology and the Humanities at the University of Maryland, attended a meeting on sustainability for the Amer AAPB in 2017, which Bernie also attended. And Trevor stated that there are four main ways that scholars want to use a public media archive. There will always be scholars who remain committed to writing in print, but are now starting to use digital resources. Then there are scholars who want to take, who have desires to take things out of an archive and recombine them into a new system. There are scholars who want to teach with them, and then there are scholars who want to use collections as data sets for text mining, audio analysis, which we've heard about today, image recognition, topic modeling, machine learning, among other uses. So in response, uh, we're still very early in this, but um, we've started working with our legal counsel to develop additional ways for scholars to use our collection, which I'll describe in more detail. The first is limited research access. Um, we know that scholars can't not all scholars have the funding to come to DC or Boston so um, to access the entire collection. So we've developed a policy allowing scholars to obtain access to certain materials not available in our online reading room via password protected two week time restricted URLs. We also allow embedding of our video player on other sites. Um, this provides scholars and students with a way to incorporate materials into the AAPB into those other systems I was talking about while we're able to maintain control over the digital file in respect of copyright and the permissions we've received from donors. The embedding feature supports researchers building digital exhibits, those referencing the AAPB and e-publications and use in digital history projects. We've also developed an application programming interface or API that allows researchers to harvest our metadata records for use in text mining and analysis. We make the metadata available both as PB Core and Mods XML and documentation is available in our GitHub repository. I don't think I included a URL here, but I can share that out with everyone. Um, but I, 
we, you talked about earlier about uh, limited metadata. We do have limited metadata, as I said earlier. A lot of what we've digitized started with just an inventory record that the stations created, not librarians or archivists. So we know that additional information and, uh, is needed uh, beyond just the descriptive metadata to support uh, research. So as I mentioned earlier, we've been creating transcripts as part of our workflow when we add new collections to the archive. Um, some collections come in with existing or gold standard perfect transcripts. That's so great when we get those. Um, but for the most part, we use a speech-to-text tool called Quality to create those transcripts, which for good quality audio without an accent can be like 91 to 95% accurate. Um, with strong accents, it can, it's down in the 80s, 70s. Um, with, I'm from Mississippi and 56% is what we got for some of the uh, material uh, that we digitized for Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Um, but the transcript research access policy, and I will say that much of the material in the collection is, is pretty high quality audio because it was broadcast um, by these stations. Um, but the transcript research access policy allows for scholars to obtain copies of our JSON and text transcripts via our transcripts API. And we're working on developing some easy to use scripts so that scholars can, um, who aren't so savvy with these digital tools can take uh, what we've done and kind of implement it into their workflows. So I, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a data scientist, I'm an archivist, but we played around with D3 visualizations to just il illustrate really simply um, what can be done with our metadata. Um, so here you see that the term Pacific within our metadata is more frequently mentioned on the West Coast, and on the East Coast, Pacific is pretty frequently used in some states nearly as often as the term Atlantic. Um, this timeline shows the frequency of the use of the uses of the names Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan over time. You see Carter's more frequently discussed in the late 70s and the early 80s, Reagan through the 80s, and Nixon had a spike just after the early 90s, which is when the Nixon Library opened. Pat Nixon died in 93, and he died in 94. Uh, here you see how often state names are mentioned together in the same recording. For example, Wisconsin and Minnesota are discussed together more often than Wisconsin and Indiana. So this is, this is the, just the text of the collection, the descriptive metadata and the transcripts, which again aren't always accurate or uh, highly accurate. Um, so we also recently developed a media as a data set policy, understanding that the use of the images and the audio themselves may support additional research possibilities beyond what the metadata and the transcripts can provide. Um, the MAD policy allows for scholars to obtain low resolution copies of the digital media in the archive for non-consumptive, bona fide research and scholarly purposes. A couple of examples of innovation in this area of computation by humanists are at the University of Texas at Austin's um, High Performance Sound Technologies for Access and Scholarship, or the HIPSTAS group, which is working on audio waveform analysis, and the University of Richmond's Distant Viewing Lab. I don't have time to talk about uh, their work specifically, but I definitely recommend you checking out uh, some of what they're exploring with their research. Um, so I've, I've shown you a couple of really simple visualizations that I did just playing around um, with our metadata and our transcripts, but now I'll tell you about uh, what some, I'll tell you about some case studies that are, act, are um, of actual use of the archive and digital scholarship initiatives. Um, we'll discuss Brandeis University, Dartmouth College, and the University of Colorado at Boulder. So we, we'll start with Brandeis University's compu uh, Computer Science and Computational Linguistics Department. Brandeis began using the AAPV collection as a data set with the goal of training and refining the output of their existing open source tools used for computational linguistics research and analysis. The, their initial goal was to improve upon the language application grid project and its support for the interoperability of video, images, and audio linguistics analysis. Because of its long chronological reach, the availability of nightly episodes from 1975 to 2018, and a consi consistent news program structure, the PBS NewsHour collection was an ideal data set for them to use. Not only is the team working to improve their own tools, but through our relationship with them, they're contributing back to the archive by providing us with metadata that they're generating about the corpus to help us improve discoverability of the collection. This collaborative effort um, has led to the development of clams. Um, our researcher at Brandeis uh, loves the Cape Cod and loves eating clams, so that's the, that's the acronym, but it's com computational linguistics applications for multimedia services, um, a platform being prototyped to aid archivists um, with automating metadata creation about their media collections. So let's go back to the lapse grid, which is the foundation of, what, uh, of, our, of our collaboration. 
Um, the Lapse Grid project is a collaboration between Brandeis, Vassar, Carnegie Mellon University, and the Linguistic Data Consortium at the University of Pennsylvania. Their efforts are funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, and their work builds upon other projects within the national language processing community. The Lapse Grid project orchest orchestrates access to and deployment of language resources, analysis tools, and processing functions available from servers and universities around the globe. It enables, un enables universities um, and users in a wide range of social science and humanities disciplines to add their own language resources, services, and even service grids. And uh, the collaborators are actively pursuing creation of interoperable global grid um, framework and, and data interchange formats. The LAPS grid provides access to basic natural language processing tools across languages and enables pipelining of tools where uh, to create custom NLP, NLP workflow applications. Um, NLP is natural language processing. Um, and it's a community-based project whereby the tools and services are contributed and ma maintained by members of the community. As I mentioned earlier, Brandeis is utilizing the PBS NewsHour collection from the AAPB. The collection includes over 14,000 digitized episodes of PBS NewsHour and its predecessor series, the Robert McNeil Report, the McNeil Lehrer Report, and the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. And we've provided them with MP4 access copies, gold standard or perfect transcripts, but do not contain time code, and PB Core XML descriptive and technical metadata. They're also using the New Jersey Nightly News collection, which includes over 1,500 episodes of the series, primarily from 1975 to 1984. Um, with this collection, they're getting the MP4 access copies, JSON speech-to-text transcripts, uh, which are not corrected but do contain timecode, and our PB4 XML metadata. So use of the AAPB collection is enabling these computational linguists to explore ways to move their community beyond the analysis of textual and towards moving images and sound through the development and integration of tools that analyze time-based media versus just the character-based media. Moving images themselves can be subject to linguistic analysis, as, we, as we've heard today, through transcription and text within video, such as captions, subtitles, credits. But there is a need for analysis tools for multimodality to an, um, analyze objects, faces, non-speech sounds, and graphics. Um, such analysis is not currently um, available within the current framework of the LAPS grid, and this is where the development of CLAMS comes in. The team has also used the collection in their development of the multimedia interchange format to support interoperability of data exchange within the LAPS grid across media and data types. As the data they're creating is often time-based, the MF format will also include alignment between and among media and annotation types. Other considerations they're taking into account as they develop MF are flexibility, scalability, and version control. Um, so here's a preliminary architectural sketch of CLAMS. Archivist will pull the containerized platform and services. The platform runs on um, as an orchestrated set of containers that are connected to a local storage with access to our data repository. And Archivist can then interact with these services, services to create, edit, and execute workflows on a web-based front-end workflow engine. Um, so you might be asking, what does such a workflow look like? So here's an example of a workflow in CLAMS. Um, I'm going to talk about the top part of this workflow, the top path, the tool chain that you see. Um, as you can see, a user of CLAMS will be able to create a tool chain pipeline of various tools to generate, refine, and create additional metadata from the initial data set and subsequent data through a certain, uh, through, uh, created through certain tools. For example, the tool chain includes a frame detector, which is the starting point on the left side, which identifies, which identifies frames that include text on the screen. The metadata created through the frame detector is then used in the next phase of the pipeline to bound the slates that appear on frames within, uh, within the video. So if you see uh, a, third, uh, a lower third, which identifies who is being interviewed and their affiliation, that's what I'm talking about with slates. The next tool in the pipeline is the OCR of those slates, and finally there's a tool for slate text processing. The data being generated through the workflow is captured via an MF data wrapper and is ultimately usable for analysis by researchers and used by archivists in metadata enhancement, both for searching as well as user navigation within a time-based media object. You may be wondering what ty specific types of new data are being generated by this team of researchers beyond what I just showed you. Um, one is scene classification of television news. Uh, they seek to classify images or scenes such as bars and tone that occur at the beginning of programs, graphics on screen, whether the guest is in a studio or out of a studio, a head with a graphic next to it, uh, reports at the desk, and other text on screen. 
Uh, scene types that are also what they're looking at classifying, such as indoors and man-made, ind outdoors, man-made, and outdoors natural, or what they called in, call in the field shots. So here are some screenshot examples of the types of scenes you might find in a 30-minute news program. Not only may the scene classification data be useful to scholars and their research, but are also data that can enable us in the archives to better provide access to our collections. For example, knowing the timed codes of the bars and tone beginning and end in the digitized programs can be used to allow researchers to quickly skip over those unnecessary one to two minutes and start a video player directly at the beginning of the program. Knowing that Jim Lehrer reported on Ethiopia in minute 16 of a 30 minute program could aid researchers in navigating the program to content that interests them. Being able to search for White House um, and finding all the images of the US White House would enable researchers to quickly find images that are relevant to them. Another tool being implemented in CLAMS is optical character, uh, optical character recognition, which I talked about uh, on the workflow slide, of text on the screen, including the digital slates, lower thirds, and credit rolls. In many cases, this level of metadata is not readily available in our metadata records, so the ability to automate the uh, extraction of this data will save a significant amount of time on our part and on the part of the researchers. Another tool that's being integrated into CLAMS is forced alignment of text transcripts that don't contain time code and, and aligning those directly to the audio and the video recordings. For example, a text transcript that contains no time code can be programmatically linked to the time code of the accompanying video file. And this type of alignment is a critical linkage uh, for multimodal analysis, providing the researcher with the ability to reference between the visual and the textual data. Um, further, as I've mentioned, CLAMS and the LAPS grid allow for pipelining of tools into a workflow, and in implementing forced alignment within such a workflow can improve the execution of tools upstream in that workflow, um, such as silence detection, bars and tone identification, as well as uh, support better metadata creation downstream in the workflow. Um, so as the Brandeis team continues their research, they're also hoping to develop integrations of tools to support chaptering of time-based media and their accompanying transcripts, uh, content or image-based video retrieval, and full named entity recognition and parsing over transcripts. So we also further hope to continue collaborating with Brandeis and University of Richmond's um, Distant Viewing Lab to launch CLAMS to other research domains, integrating the Distant Viewing Toolkit being developed at University of Richmond, which would allow researchers to create and publish their own data sets from the AAPB collection based on their research interests and explore the data set via integrated visualization tools and faceted searches. More on this um, hopefully soon after we hear back from about a grant. Um, so next I'll talk about uh, Dartmouth College's Film and Media Studies Department and specifically the Media Ecology Project led by Professor Mark Williams um, and their use of the AAPB collection. So the Media Ecology Project is in, uh, provides online access to primary moving image research materials and engages new forms of scholarly production and online publishing. The project seeks to develop new capacities for access to and interrogation of media history via digital tools and computational reading dialectics. The goals of Media Ecology Project, or the MEP, are to create a sustainable project regarding media history as public memory, engaging scholars through network scholarships in relation to online archival content, promoting and augmenting uh, dynamic ecology of historical media, supporting the essential work of archives and libraries in relation to the public sphere, um, and engaging primary research across disciplines. Like the Brandeis team, the MEP sees collaboration with libraries and archives as integral, integral to their work. They seek their objectives as not only supporting scholarship of media studies and other, other domains, but also as a means to add value back to libraries and archives involved in the effort. Through their use of archival collections within the MEP environment, uh, scholars are able to search, interact with, and annotate collections, and such annotations may be useful in making uh, archives more discoverable. The project also seeks to advocate for prioritization and preservation of collections based on scholar interests. 
So the MEP ecosystem incorporates existing uh, tools and services that some of you might be familiar with, MediaThread, Scalar, and Onomy.org. MediaThread is a platform that supports multimedia analysis within a communal environment. Uh, instructors using MediaThread are able to designate collections within a course um, and, and allow their students to lift video, audio, and image items from those collections, annotate them, and embed them into compositions within a course-specific website. Uh, Scalar is a semantic web, uh, open source web authoring tool and publishing platform that's designed for um, allowing users to assemble media from multiple sources and juxtapose them within their own writing in a variety of ways. Um, Onomy.org is a site where you can create taxonomies, folksonomies, and other forms of controlled vocabularies for use in the semantic web. Um, so the Civil Rights News Film Collection Project is currently underway through a collaboration between the MEP researchers and several participating archives, including the AAPB. The goals of this project are to engage scholars and, and students in annotation and research of television news film collections related to civil rights and social justice movements between 1950 and 1980. The goal of the project is to build upon a local national model that I've demonstrated with regard to the AAPB collection and also support collaborative networked research across uh, institutions. And also the project is developing what is called the semantic web, uh, the semantic annotation tool, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So how are we contributing to this effort? Uh, the project is, is an example of how our archive has enabled researchers to take things um, out of our archive system and incorporate it into a new system, whereby content in our online reading room is available through the MEP ecosystem. Uh, MEP users are able to explore and annotate AAPB content as part of their research and coursework alongside archival content from other organizations. The time-based annotations that are being created by the students and the researchers that describe specific clips um, within these files can be used in digital research essays that are open to scholarly emphases across academic disciplines, and those annotations are also provided back to the AAPB. Um, we've just started evaluating some of what was delivered to us in a pilot uh, test project, um, and some of it is useful, and I'll show you in a moment uh, what that looks like. So the materials that Dartmouth is using from our collection include civil rights movement re related television and radio programs and interviews. Uh, the media remains hosted on our server and is streamed through the MEP platform, um, and the team is also harvesting our metadata. So this is just an example of the media thread interface where researchers can annotate items at an item level and add specific time codes with both tags and longer form annotations. Uh, the semantic annotation tool that I talked about uh, is also being developed through this project, um, which will allow for researchers to create annotations and document their analysis within frames of video and not just um, tags that are separate from the video itself. And I know this is way too small to read, but this is just an example of some of the time-based annotations that we've received from a pilot test. Um, the spreadsheet includes our original identifier that we're able to connect back to our metadata records with ad added natural language annotations, tags, URIs to those tags um, that they've created as part of their folksonomy for the project, and timestamps. So finally, I'll speak about how the University of Colorado Boulder's Media and Climate Change Observatory at the Center for Science and Technology Policy Research aims to use the collection to study how climate change has or hasn't been reported by public media. Uh, MECO, or the Media and Climate Change Observatory, University of Colorado Boulder, monitors co uh, coverage of climate change across 89 sources, newspapers, TV, and radio in 31 countries in seven different regions around the world. They assemble data by accessing archives through LexisNexis, ProQuest, and Factiva databases through the University of Colorado Libraries. Um, the sources are incorporated into their research based on geographical diversity, high circulation, and reliable access to the collections over time. Each month, the team releases a monthly monitoring survey that includes uh, narrative analysis of media coverage of climate change during the previous month. Um, with reports on quantitative analyses of data sets and qualitative examinations of discourses in those data sets. The data sets are then uh, downloadable from the MECO website to promote transparency and support further research. The team incorporates visualizations into their reports from timelines such as this one showing world newspaper coverage of climate change or global warming across continents and via word clouds uh, showing the frequency of words invoked in media coverage of climate change. 
Uh, so the top left is coverage in U.S. newspapers. The top right is coverage in U.S. television. The bottom left is coverage in United Kingdom newspapers. And the bottom right is Indian newspapers. Uh, these word clouds provide users with a visualization of what is being discussed along the issue of climate change in newspapers and television. MECO already monitors 89 different sources, so why add the AAPB to the mix? Uh, they see value in incorporating the AAPB's data set into their research to explore ways in which climate change emerged in U.S. public discourse uh, through public media and to help develop monitoring measures for historical media sources um, across multiple platforms and scales on both the local and the national level in, in the United States. And previously, these analyses have been limited to U.S. commercial television coverage, um, not public broadcasting. Again, these researchers seek to use news collections within the AAPB. Um, so in addition to the NewsHour collection, they seek to use local news collections in, in the archive across regions, uh, from Buffalo and Boston in the east, to the Midwest in Iowa and Minnesota, to the West Coast in California and Alaska. Uh, so the questions that I'm interested in seeing them, uh, them look at are, how has the conversation around the growing climate crisis differed across regions? What, um, how, you know, how frequently have uh, the news talked about floods and wildfires and, uh, and not mention climate change or global warming. That's something that's interesting to me. But I'll end with this slide. Uh, you may be familiar with this graphic that was published by OCLC um, back in, I think, 2012. It's called the Collaboration Continuum, uh, which was published in their report, Beyond the Silos of the Lambs, Collaboration Between, uh, Collaboration Among Libraries, Archives, and Museums. So on the left, you see an initial form of contact uh, moving towards the right are more involved levels and, of collaboration through um, cooperation, coordination, collaboration, and then finally convergence. Um, so I'm interested, in you, and as I've talked about in my presentation, not only are we making our collection available to researchers to use in their own research, but finding ways that we can develop mutually symbiotic relationships and collaborate that uh, helps us uh, improve both of our uh, research and, and goals and, and missions within our own institutions. Um, along the continuum, the more in there is more investment, the more you move farther right on the continuum, there's more risk, but there al is also more benefit. Um, so not only am I interested in continuing to work with researchers in different domains, but also as archivists in a public bro broadcasting environment where we don't get to really often interact with researchers like you do at your institutions. That's another reason why I'm glad to be here today to tell you about this resource and to get your feedback on what we can do to make it more usable to scholars um, across domains. So thank you. Uh, that was an incredible presentation. Thank you so much. And the tools that you're developing at those archives are really impressive, and I look forward to sharing them uh, with, with people on our campus. I had a question about the archive and public broadcasting content. Uh, anecdotally, I've always understood that third-party rights were a huge obstacle to making some of these available over the past years, both documentaries and shows. So as you have put those particular uh, products in the archive, have you already cleared in advance third-party rights for music and images and, and audio from sources that weren't originally um, within uh, the local networks? Uh, because that's, uh, as I said, I've understood that that's always been a huge obstacle. So we have gotten permission uh, from the stations to the extent that they own rights in the programs that they are providing to us. And for the most part, the stations produce the work, so they own the work as a whole. But as you said, there are often limited third-party rights, such as images that are incorporated or recorded music. Um, and so we've developed a what we call our bucket policy and bucket analysis with our legal counsel, um, where we have developed a rigorous um, review process, but also an efficient process that allows us to, once we get permission from the station to the extent that they own rights in it, to make a fair use analysis based on the nature of the content um, and in consideration of our efforts to make it available online to the public as an archive. Uh, we've looked at um, work being done, uh, the fair use guide to research, the research library's uh, guide to fair use, uh, which Peter Hurdle worked on, who's also advised us on the project. 
Um, but for example, we get, as I, I talked about some of the genres of the content in the archive, and we consider making uh, more informative, factual type genres available in our online reading room less risky. Uh, you know, d local documentaries, news reports, um, talk shows, debates, event coverage. We feel pretty comfortable making that available online, understanding there might be some limited third party material. Dramatic works, uh, live music performances, uh, works significantly presenting visual art, those art tend to stay on, on site only. Um, but since 2015, when we launched our online reading room, we've never received a takedown notice. Um, we've you know, never been contacted about it, and I think people are really excited to see it available again. We also, m music is an issue I know for other institutions, is not an issue so much for public broadcasting. There's actually a uh, provision in the copyright law, section 114 and 118, that allow public broadcasters to distribute sound recordings. So we're able to rely on that to make sound recordings available online. Not live music performances, which is our, our another issue. Um, I, I have a question about, uh, so all of these projects sound awesome. Um, so how do you, how do these projects begin and how do you kind of adjudicate between them? Because it seems like you kind of have three different teams that are kind of all doing different things with the archive. And so, you know, if 10 people from this meeting email you tomorrow and say, I want to do this massive project with the archive, how do you all resolve those questions? Well, um, so we've developed these policies and the APIs where as, as soon as a researcher agrees to our rules of use, um, we're able to provide them with the metadata, the transcripts. The, with media as a data set, uh, it's a little bit more involved where they have to let us know the parameters of their research. Then they provide us with a hard drive. We download the files and send them a hard drive uh, that they have to agree to. Uh, we've talked about um, in, you know, uh, archiving of data sets, but right now we have to you know, inform them that they need to destroy the copies at the end of their research project and not make it publicly available. Um, but also, uh, that's part of my job is to kind of advise and provide feedback. It, uh, you know, the onus is mostly on the researchers to kind of do their research, but we've developed sample scripts that they can use and, you know, we have conversations with them. Um, we also, as part of our media as a data set policy, we ask that the researchers agree to consult with us on how we can make use of the metadata that they create through their project at our discretion, you know, understanding that it might not be valuable for us to make use of. Um, but we are really interested and excited about this. And um, we also work with, in, with institutions on grant proposals, um, which help fund some of our work. But a lot of the people that I meet it just meet on Twitter or Reddit, and that's how I find these researchers. Uh, just really, Georgia State University, I noticed that our two local public um, broadcasters um, have a lot of files that are mostly just file names, and there are very few uh, are there that are actually available. Can you point to any examples of um, successful migrations from that sort of rudimentary metadata to good metadata and digitization, particularly any that involve academic libraries working with their public broadcasters? Uh, so the Council on Library and Information Resources Recordings at Risk grant, grant Program is what we've been pointing stations to over the past couple of years, and I've been working really closely with them on writing grant proposals to get funding to digitize their work, and we include in those project plans uh, cataloging and creation of good metadata, also creation of the transcripts. Unfortunately, we have a huge backlog of material that has been digitized that right now we just don't have funding to assign. We don't have catalogers. Um, so that's one way, one reason why we're kind of prioritizing some of the work with Brandeis because we see, uh, we're hopeful that the work that they're doing with the uh, computational linguistics analysis and uh, the creation of some of these open source tools to potentially metadata or automate some of the metadata that would otherwise, otherwise need to be created manually by a human. Um, but we understand, you know, human validation is always going to be required, so we're kind of developing workflows around validation of metadata as well. But also when we, when we do hear from researchers about they're interested in using parts of the collection, we do kind of, we do guide them to the collections within the archive that have good quality metadata and are more likely to uh, yield good results. Uh, 
Hi, Joelle Pitts, uh, Kansas State University. You talked a little bit about your transcripting process and sort of the margins of error that you're seeing in some of those. Um, and of course that has implications for the research projects um, that you talked about, but it also has the accessibility implications. So I'm curious if you just accept sort of a margin of error for those, and if so, what is your margin? Uh, and then if you don't, do you go back and do some kind of manual quality control, and how do you scale that mm -hmm. at this level? So we, uh, for materials that were broadcast with captions, and we have got, we do have a lot of materials that were broadcast with captions and we're digitizing those tapes, we retain the closed captioning files. So we do have good quality transcript or captioning for those. Um, then when we're creating transcripts, um, we, we make clear on our metadata records next to the uh, transcript that we provide next to the video player that this was computer generated. It's not going to be accurate. We have removed the feature from Spanish language content where we don't have a uh, transcript at all. Or, you know, we don't have a, a Spanish transcript for it and the English speech to text tried to create an English transcript out of it um, and other languages. Um, but we, we, we do make it publicly available. We make clear this was computer generated. But we also have um, been trying to engage the public in helping us correct transcripts, but it's a very slow process. It, it really is just a good way to engage people who are interested in helping out the archive um, through a project uh, that we got from IMLS to build crowdsourcing tools for correction of transcripts. And we've only corrected 200. Um, but uh, we're, we're doing what we can with the resources that we have.